Hey everyone, Path here. Now, there are a lot of fantastic videos on YouTube talking about the Schrodinger equation, which is the most important equation in all of quantum mechanics. I've even made a couple of videos on this topic myself, but in this video I wanted to talk about how we can use the Schrodinger equation, this all-important equation, to tell us something about the real world. Up until now, all of my videos on the Schrodinger equation have dealt with rather abstract ideas in order to help us understand the basics of quantum theory. But the whole point of us having this equation in the first place is for us to be able to make predictions about the real world that we observe around us. One of the simplest ways to do this is to study a hydrogen atom. Now this is the simplest kind of atom, usually only containing a single proton and a single electron, and we can look at what the Schrodinger equation would look like for a hydrogen atom. And in the process, we might even get an understanding of why the Schrodinger equation is so difficult to solve for more complex atoms. To begin, let's understand that this term in the generic Schrodinger equation is known as the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is very closely related to the total energy of any system we happen to be considering. Now, for more information on this, as well as the whole equation in general, please do check out this video on my channel. But in order to find the Hamiltonian for a hydrogen atom, let's start by considering its total energy. First, let's look at the hydrogen atom's kinetic energy. Now, to keep things simple, we will consider the kinetic energy of both particles together, rather than the kinetic energy of each individual particle. We can do this by calculating what is known as the reduced mass of the pair of particles. This is essentially equivalent to following the motion of the center of mass of a hydrogen atom. And this center of mass ends up being somewhere quite close to the proton, because the proton is so much heavier than the electron. And this way we treat the hydrogen atom as one system with one reduced mass rather than two separate particles. It just makes life easier that way. So the kinetic energy of a hydrogen atom is related to any motion that the center of mass of a hydrogen atom might have. If we want to express this mathematically, that looks something like this. Now this expression might look quite different to the usual half mv squared kinetic energy that we're used to in classical physics. Now this downward pointing triangle, by the way, in our kinetic energy expression is known as a nabla or a del. And I've made a video talking all about that, so check that out up here if you haven't seen it already. So, kinetic energy covered. Let's now talk about the potential energy of our system. The most obvious form of potential energy in this system is the electrostatic attraction between the two particles. They're oppositely charged particles, and charged particles interact with each other. To calculate this potential energy, we can steal the classical equation directly. For two charged particles, charges Q1 and Q2, a distance r apart from each other, or more specifically the centers of mass are a distance r apart from each other, the potential energy of this system is given by this expression. Q1 multiplied by Q2 divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r, where epsilon naught is a universal constant. It's known as the permittivity of free space. Is just a property of, I guess, the vacuum of empty space, if you want to think about it like that. Again, if you want to know where this equation comes from, because I realize if you're unfamiliar with it, it might look like I'm just pulling it out of thin air, resources in the description. So like I said, we can take this equation and pull it into the quantum mechanical world and find the potential energy of our system. For a hydrogen atom, let's set the distance r to be the distance between the centers of mass of our electron and proton. Let's say that the charge on our electron is minus E, minus because electrons are negatively charged, and E is 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. This is the standard electronic charge. As far as we understand it, every single electron has this same amount of charge. And the charge of the proton is simply plus E, so the same magnitude or size, but the opposite sign. And at this point, we've expressed the potential energy of our system in terms of the charges of the two particles and the distance between them, whatever that distance may be. And at this point, we've considered both the kinetic energy and the potential energy of our system. We can take these two quantities and plug them into our Hamiltonian, stick the Hamiltonian back into our Schrodinger equation, and then do some maths to try and find something out. It turns out that this equation is one that we know how to solve. We have mathematical techniques that allow us to solve it. It's not easy, it's very complicated to say the least, but it is doable. When we solve this equation, we find, the equation tells us, that the electron should only be able to occupy very specific energy levels. And it also tells us what the energies of these energy levels should be. In other words, our theory, using the Schrodinger equation, seems to give a pretty accurate representation of how a hydrogen atom behaves in real life. 
We know this because we've done a lot of experiments using hydrogen atoms and they seem to behave just like this. And we found this prediction by first finding the Hamiltonian for our system, plugging the Hamiltonian back into the Schrodinger equation, and then solving the Schrodinger equation. Doing so told us the allowed wave functions for our system, or in other words, which energy levels our electron was allowed to occupy. Except when we make more precise measurements of the hydrogen atom in real life, when we essentially look more closely at these energy levels, we find that they're split up. Admittedly, the energy levels they're split up into are very close in energy, because it took us making these precise measurements to even realize that there are more energy levels than what we see. But these energy levels are indeed split up. This is known as the fine structure of the hydrogen atom. The original levels that we saw were known as the gross structure because this is the highest level structure that we see. And when we look a bit closer, we see the fine structure. Turns out that when we look even closer, we see a hyperfine structure too, but we won't go into too much detail about that here. So how do we explain this fine structure using our quantum mechanical theory? Well, one way to explain the fine structure using our theory is to introduce more terms to the Hamiltonian. As it turns out, we haven't quite considered all forms of energy within our system. There are some energy contributions that are admittedly much smaller than the kinetic and potential energy, hence resulting in a much finer structure. But the fact is that we haven't even thought about them yet, and hence we haven't yet been able to predict the fine structure. Turns out there are three terms we need to consider if we want to correctly predict the fine structure using our quantum mechanical theory. These account firstly for a relativistic treatment of our system because turns out the electron can move quite fast in a hydrogen atom and so we do need to consider at least special relativity and then we need to consider a term that deals with what's known as the spin of our particles. We start by just considering the spin of the electron and finally, we also need to consider a completely quantum mechanical term known as the Darwin term. Now, these three terms deserve a video of their own, and I do want to make this video at some point in the future. But the point is that these three terms provide a much smaller contribution to the structure of our hydrogen atom, hence contributing to the fine structure. And because we've now added these terms to our Hamiltonian, our theoretical prediction will more closely match what we observe in real life. And at this point, we can see just to predict the fine structure of a simple hydrogen atom, we've had to use a large number of terms in our Hamiltonian. And we haven't even considered the hyperfine structure yet. And additionally, we've had to make some simplifications and approximations in order to make the maths even doable at this stage. For example, the relativistic correction that we made to our original Hamiltonian is actually only the largest order term of the full relativistic correction, which is actually an infinite series. The idea is that all of these smaller terms don't really make a noticeable contribution, so we only use the first one, but it still is an approximation. And when we try and do a similar sort of thing for the next atom up in the periodic table, which is helium, let's say two protons, two electrons, things only get worse from here, mathematically speaking. And this is just for a helium atom. Forget lithium, beryllium, boron, and so on and so forth. Don't even think about anything like uranium. I mean, I guess the point is, I hope this goes to show a couple of things. Firstly, how the Schrodinger equation is used to model stuff that we see in real life, such as the hydrogen atom, for example. And secondly, that it's quite tricky to do this at all. It gets harder and harder as we consider more and more complex atoms, but it's already quite difficult even for the simplest one. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Hit that bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload, and please do check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for all your support. I will see you very soon.